Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. I'm Kirsten Wakefield. I'm a stakeholder outreach liaison with Maricos and NACAN. And today we're excited to have Meredith White, Mike Congrove, and Peter Hughes presenting their coast-to-coast -coast perspectives about the challenges of ocean acidification on the commercial shellfish industry. But before we get to that, a quick look at our upcoming webinar series. This is the third webinar in our current series. The next one on April 22nd will focus on OA action planning at the state level with an overview from Ocean Alliance and case studies from Maine and New York. Our webinar series will conclude on May 28th at 11 a.m. with a webinar focused on the next decade of OA science at NOAA, National and Mid-Atlantic Research Plans. We will be sending out registration links for both shortly. As I mentioned previously, we're excited to have three industry members sharing their coast-to-coast -coast perspectives on OA with us today. They are Meredith White from Mook Sea Farm in Maine, Mike Congro from Oyster Seed Holdings in Virginia, and Peter Hughes from Atlanta Keeps Fishery. He'll be speaking about Island Scallops Limited, located in British Columbia. Uh, just a short introduction for each. Meredith White is Director of Research and Development in Mook Sea Farm, with projects ranging from microalgae production, to larval oyster production optimization, to understanding impacts of ocean and coastal acidification on juvenile oysters. She received her PhD in biological oceanography from Whipple Oceanographic Institution, studying the impacts of OA on larval bivalves, and she completed a postdoc at Bigelow Labs, studying the impacts of OA on coccolithophores and predator-prey interactions. As part of her work at MSF, she also works on stakeholder engagement as a member of the steering committees for the Maine Ocean and Coastal Acidification Partnership, and the Northeast Coastal Acidification Network, NECAN. She also served as the chair of the NECAN Industry Working Group from 2016 to 2019. Our next presenter, Mike Congrove, has been the hatchery manager of Oyster Seed Holdings since its inception in 2009 and the sole owner since 2014. He received a bachelor's in science in marine science from Old Dominion University and a master of science in fishery science from Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Oyster Seed Holdings Incorporated is a large-scale oyster hatchery in the Mid-Atlantic, located on the western shore of Chesapeake Bay on Gwynn's Island in Matthews County. OSH produces an excess of 100 million single seed and 500 million eyed larvae for the fat on shell market each season. A forward-thinking and efficiency-minded hatchery, OSH utilizes high-density algae larvae setting and feed systems, always striving to produce more animals using fewer resources. OSH is also very science-minded and collaborates often with academia, other producers, and supports organizations like NACAN in their pursuit of practically applied science to support our industry. Our third speaker today, Peter Hughes, is the Director of Sustainability for Atlanta Capes Fisheries, located in Cape May, New Jersey. After commercial fishing for squid and mackerel on the East Coast, Peter started working for Atlanta Capes Fisheries in 1990. He is currently a voting member of the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council, and a liaison to the New England Fisheries Management Council, helping facilitate policy and the responsible stewardship of our nation's oceans. Peter is also a founder and chairman of the Responsible Offshore Development Alliance, founder and co-chair of the Responsible Offshore Science Alliance, board member of the Science Center for Marine Fisheries, a National Science Foundation recognized center, and a board member of the Fisheries Survival Fund. Following the presentations, we've invited several scientists today focused on carbonate chemistry and sustainable aquaculture in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic regions to join in the discussion. They are Joe Salisbury from UNH, Jeremy Testa from UMCES Chesapeake Biological Lab, and Daphne Monroe from Rutgers University and the Haskins Shellfish Research Lab. I'll introduce them briefly after our main presenter to finish their presentation. At the conclusion of the discussion, we'll have about 20 minutes remaining for questions from the audience. All participants will be muted during the question and answer session, so please ask your questions via the question box. Anthony Himes, a PhD student at Virginia Institute of Marine Science, and the Virginia Sea Grant Fellow assisting with MACAN efforts will be collating the questions to ask at the end of the presentation, so feel free to submit your questions at any time. And just a quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the MACAN website on the resources page with our previous webinar series. So without further ado, Let's hear from our first presenter, Meredith White. Hi. Uh, so I'm Meredith White. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, today, I will be talking about how Mook Sea Farm has experienced ocean acidification and what we are doing to uh, prepare for further change in the future. So. 
Mook Sea Farm is a vertically integrated uh, oyster farm on the Damariscotta River in Maine, and the farm operates almost like two separate businesses. The hatchery where we raise seed oysters and sell them to other oyster farms from North Carolina to Maine, and then the grow out, which you see here, where we raise seed, uh, seed oysters to market size on the Damariscotta River. And to orient you, this is the Gulf of Maine, and now we'll zoom in onto mid-coast Maine, and then we'll zoom further into the Damariscotta River. And the most important thing to know about the Damariscotta River is that this is a drowned river valley embayment, not a true freshwater river. And the tidal influence extends all the way up the river with salinities of around uh, 28 parts per thousand. Our farms, our active lease sites, are located in the upper Damariscotta River with a, lint, a winter lease site in the lower part of the estuary where it does not ice over. And I, I really want to, in this talk, emphasize the difference between open ocean acidification and coastal acidification. Open ocean acidification is driven by increases in atmospheric CO2, which certainly also influences coastal acidification. But coastal acidification is further affected by coastal upwelling, uh, seasonal primary production and eutrophication and freshwater input. So for example, these are data from the Mook Sea Farm seawater monitoring system at the hatchery intake from the summer of 2017. And this system is run uh, through uh, the Opal Laboratory with Joe Salisbury and Chris Hunt from the University of New Hampshire. So you can see uh, from these figures that the PCO2 in the upper figure and the pH in the lower figure both vary, vary considerably over the course of the summer. And in fact, for several weeks, the pH was below the pH predicted for the open ocean at the end of this century. But since the atmospheric PCO2 remained constant throughout the summer, we can surmise that changes in the seawater PCO2 were due to changes in net respiration and net photosynthesis. So it's been well established by multiple laboratory studies that ocean acidification negatively impacts bivalve larvae. This image shows the kinds of abnormal shell development that are experienced by larvae grown in low saturation state conditions on the right compared to ambient conditions on the left. And these larvae are uh, one, two, and four days old. And you can also see that larvae grown in high CO2 conditions are significantly smaller than those grown in ambient conditions. Mook Sea Farm started to have uh, larval production problems in 2009, which were manifested by severe developmental delays. Because our operation depends on reliable production, it's really important that we can consistently be producing larvae in a known time frame. And having these developmental delays made the production year extremely poor. The hatchery quickly realized that these problems were occurring following heavy rainfall events, but didn't know why that was. And so after consulting with West Coast Hatcheries and with Joe Salisbury, uh, Bill Mook was able to determine that the problems were due to lower saturation states and they were following heavy rainfall events. So it was clear that those low saturation states were driven by fresh water. And fresh water has a lower saturation state than seawater. So when rivers mix with the ocean, it lowers the saturation state of that water. And here we're looking at a plot of saturation state, which shows that the Kennebec River in Maine influences the saturation state well into Casco Bay. And uh, you can see, I think, I hope you can see my mouse, that the Damariscotta River is red with high saturation states well up into the estuary. But when there is a heavy rain event, then the saturation state in the Damariscotta River will also lower. And in fact, the, the Northeast US has already experienced an increase in 71% in intense precipitation events in roughly the last half century, which is more than any other region in the country. And we're also projected to experience even more precipitation in the future. So this figure is showing the projected uh, relative percent change in seasonal precipitation in New England from the period of 1971 to 2000 to the period of 2041 to 2070. And a positive value means that there is a projected increase in uh, precipitation for that season. And so we're seeing that for New England, precipitation is projected to increase in the winter, spring, and autumn seasons, 
with a decrease in precipitation in the summer. And this projected increase in the winter and spring means that the water we pump into our hatchery during those seasons will have lower saturation states and would affect our larval production. But the good news is that this problem has an easy solution in the hatchery. We measure the pH at every water change, and then we buffer the water to an optimal pH every time. We've implemented this approach ever since 2009. Now we're at the point where we're buffering all of the water used in our hatchery. And I have this uh, carboy circled because that carboy is holding our buffer solution that we use for our static larval tanks. Uh, larval production in these highly controlled conditions is more reliable than it ever was before. And the larvae consistently grow fast. There's high survival and there's high conversion to juveniles. And that makes it very reliable. For us, the management is a really simple system and it solved the ocean acidification problem in the hatchery. So now we are more concerned with understanding how OA will affect juvenile, uh, or we call them seed oysters, after they leave our hatchery. And this summer we completed a project funded uh, through CNET with the University of Maine uh, in collaboration with Nicole Price and the Casco Bay Estuary Partnership. But before I get into that uh, work, I want to point out that while ocean and coastal acidification has a reasonable solution for hatchery production, aquaculture industries that are dependent on wild set like the blue mussel and sea scallop industries those industries are still vulnerable to ocean acidification as oa intensifies wild set will become less and less reliable so developing hatchery techniques for these species would strengthen those industries and provide resilience to oa and additionally hatchery production allows for the possibility of selective breeding for phenotypes that are able to withstand OA and other environmental stressors. So to look now I'll go back to the project I just started to talk about uh, to look at OA impacts on juveniles this past summer we addressed uh, the problem through two different questions how does OCA affect seed oysters when they've left controlled conditions in the hatchery and are grown in upwellers? And can ground up shell hash buffer the water in upwellers as a mitigation strategy? We had many funding sources and partners for this work, so I acknowledge them here. And we developed an experimental design with four treatments. They followed the natural variability seen in the ambient control, but with a constant offset of either minus 0.2 or minus 0.4 pH units below the control. And that was uh, affected by the addition of CO2 through solenoid valves. And then the fourth treatment included shell hash to test the mitigative potential of the shell hash. This work was performed over five weeks this past summer by two undergraduate interns at Mook Sea Farm, and the water for each treatment was manipulated in one of these barrels with three replicate upweller silos in the barrels. Packets of shell hash were placed at the bottom of each silo in treatment four. So this figure shows the pH over the four experimental weeks. For this and the other graphs I'll show, blue represents ambient seawater, the yellow represents the minus 0.2 pH units below ambient, and red represents the minus 0.4 pH units. You can see strong diurnal variability, which is typical for coastal regions, but in this case, the, that variability appeared to be driven by high respiration rates in the upwellers. But even with that variability, we, for the most part, maintained our pH offsets. Uh, between the treatments. So now we're looking at the mean calcification rates of three replicate silos for each treatment with standard error. Uh, when we looked at weekly calcification rates, the treatments followed the pattern that we expected with the ambient treatment having the highest calcification rate followed by the minus 0.2 pH unit uh, treatment and then the minus 0.4 treatment having the lowest calcific calcification rate. And when we add in treatment four, we can see that at weeks three and four, the calcification rates of oysters in those silos were greater than oysters in silos with the same pH treatment without shell hash, which indicates that the shell hash does have some amount of mitigative effect on oysters. But this trend did not persist to week five. And then furthermore, uh, oh, excuse me, uh, sorry. Furthermore, despite the trends, there were no statistically significant differences among treatments. 
And again, when we look at tissue weights, the trend, uh, the first three treatments followed a similar trend as calcification rates with tissue weights decreasing with decreasing pH. But this time, when we look at the shell hash treatment, we see that oysters in this treatment had consistently lower tissue weights than oysters in corresponding treatments uh, with no shell hash. Based on some of the chlorophyll data, the shell hash may have interfered with phytoplankton moving through the silo. But again, there were no significant differences among the treatments. So in conclusion, we exposed these oysters to very extreme conditions, but we didn't see significant responses to OA, which indicates that seed oysters may be resilient to OA. With, uh, excuse me, seed oysters may be resilient to OA, and shell hash may buffer the water to improve oyster growth in the future. But I really want to emphasize this present day food level um, aspect because if the oysters are able to consume enough food to compensate for increased energetic demands, they appear to be okay. But if food levels diminish in the future, this response may not actually be the same. And that could certainly be tested uh, by another future experiment. So, OCA has severe impacts on larval bivalve development, but can be overcome in hatcheries. Seed and market oysters may be more resilient to OCA than larvae. And expansion of hatchery operations and selective breeding could lead to broader industry resiliency and business opportunities. So thank you so much. And that concludes uh, my presentation. Thank you, Meredith, so much for that presentation. And we'll give Mike a minute to get set up and start with his. But thank you very much. Mike, are you all set to go? Yeah, I think so. You got my screen now? Okay. Yep, your screen's up. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. All right, well, thanks very much for the opportunity to talk um, at this webinar today. Uh, my name is Mike Congrove. I run uh, um, a large scale private commercial oyster hatchery um, in Virginia. Uh, we've also been working on ocean acidification for the last several years. Um, our conclusions are, are less clear than what Meredith presented and what they've experienced up in Maine. And so, um, you know, I, we'll get into that a little bit later, but first, um, let me kind of talk just a little more specifically about what hatcheries do, if there's anybody um, you know, in the audience that isn't quite sure. Um, so this um, panel of pictures, there's uh, four columns. Um, and on the far left uh, is algae production. So hatcheries uh, produce all the food that they need to feed the animals with um, inside the hatchery. They also condition brood stock in that second column. So we get uh, adult oysters ready to feed, or I'm sorry, ready to spawn. Um, the third column, we produce oyster larvae, which is the most sensitive to um, acidification problems. And then as Meredith was getting into, um, the fourth thing you do in a hatchery is, is take uh, the larvae through metamorphosis into the juvenile seed phase um, and get them a little bit bigger until they can go out into more nursery type systems. And so we're really kind of concentrating on that third column here because that's um, what's at most risk um, from ocean acidification and what in our hatchery and a lot of other hatcheries um, is the, the least inconsistent or you can have the most problems with during production. So I will orient you to where we are. Um, so we're located about mid coast on the East Coast. Um, Chesapeake Bay spans from Virginia and Maryland. If you, <clears throat> so going left to right, I'll, I'll zoom you in. So that left panel shows the Virginia portion of the bay, um, the center panel, we're looking at kind of the middle peninsula there and that black arrow is pointing at Gwens Island where our hatchery is located. Um, and then on the far right panel, um, we're on the inside of that island on a little body of water called Milford Haven. Um, <clears throat> this photo um, is looking east 
um, at fabled Gwen's Island here. Um, so that's the main stem of the bay kind of on the horizon there. Um, the black arrow is pointing at our facility. Um, that's Milford Haven there between the island on the left and the mainland on the right. Um, we basically have two openings to um, where water exchanges into Milford Haven. One with the main stem of the bay just out of the frame to the right, and then one down here at the bottom of the frame um, through the narrows uh, where the bridge connects to the island. And so um, this is a, a quick plot showing uh, both larvae and seed production in our hatchery over our existence, basically. We've been operating for um, 11 seasons now. Um, and we've really, um, since the first couple of years, struggled with consistent larvae production. Now, one of the reasons that the larvae bars go down is because we've, we've focused our attention into seed production. That's partly because of market, but also partly because of the inconsistent nature of larvae production um, and our ability to have a more consistent revenue stream by producing more seed. Um, but in the last few years, our seed production has become more um, inconsistent as well. Um, we've been thinking about ocean acidification in Virginia for a while now, since uh, the West Coast started thinking about it more specifically and, and tying some problems with their larval production to it. Um, but when we started seeing this, the first thing we did was to go back and try to get an idea of what, what the water quality was like at our site. Um, and so this is the same uh, panel of pictures that I showed at the beginning. The red dot um, shows a water quality monitoring station that has a relatively long track record of, of basic water quality um, measurements that have been taken uh, since the mid 80s. And so this panel is a little bit busy, but um, what we have is uh, salinity on the left, pH in the middle, and water temperature on the right. Um, the top row is um, samples taken at that site at one meter in depth, um, the middle row at four meters in depth, the bottom row at 11 meters in depth. And what's really interesting is that all the trends that you see in this data are, are basically what is expected of climate change and of ocean acidification. So we see decreasing salinity at, at that site, um, decreasing pH and increasing water temperature. And here are the relative approximate changes over that period of time. Um, I apologize, I don't think I did put the timeline on, but that was from 1985 to um, 2018, I think is the analysis that I did. I did that a couple of years ago. But it gives you this picture of what the difference is over that um, roughly 30 year period of time. Um, and so th these are of considerable concern um, and are basically um, highlighting what, you know, um, climate change trends are telling us is that we're seeing the exact same things happening right here uh, where the hatchery is located. And so um, Virginia has been working toward getting a better understanding of water quality in general as it applies to hatcheries. Um, that started with some early efforts in 2010 and 2013 to get hatcheries better set up to to monitor basic water chemistry, um, including nutrient chemistry and some more rudimentary methods of um, looking at carbonate chemistry. Um, in 2015, uh, kind of a, a loose consortium of um, hatcheries, well, I shouldn't say loose, so a, a conglomeration of private hatcheries in Virginia came together with uh, Virginia Tech, VIMS, uh, Joe Salisbury's lab at UNH, and VMRC to get some SK funding to look more specifically at um, the carbonate chemistry and to use the PCO2 monitoring systems that Joe Salisbury's lab has to better understand what was really going on in the, uh, the carbonate chemistry. Um, and, and like um, at MOOC Seed Farms, we also see relatively low uh, aragonite saturation at certain periods of time through the year. Although ours has been a little bit more sporadic and we haven't been able to um, tie it to one specific uh, event. Uh, so for example, Mooksy Farms, they see it after heavy rainfall events. Ours has been a, a This slide shows some work done by Alan Barton et al. Um, at Whiskey Creek Hatchery over on the West Coast. And so when they were really starting to get, oh, this was 2012, when they were getting, starting to get a better understanding of what was really causing their larval failures and that it had to do with aragonite saturation, uh, they basically did a to uh, 
aragonite saturation in the initial um, fill water for their tanks. Um, and what they saw was a relatively, um, not a very tight relationship early on, but a pretty tight relationship as you went through. So um, in panels C and D on the bottom, the left and right um, panels on the bottom of the Barton plot there, um, they show a reasonable uh, correlation of um, larval performance and essentially higher aragonite sash having better larval performance. Um, with the data that we were able to collect in 16 and 17, um, uh, we did similar analysis. Um, so on the right-hand side for 2016 is a two-day survival and basically a uh, final survival on the bottom um, at our hatchery. And what's immediately obvious is we don't have nearly as tight of a relationship as um, Barton was able to establish in 2012. And if we look at 2017, um, let's see, did my slide advance? It did, I apologize. Um, we see basically the same thing. Um, we don't see any kind of trend developing as we um, get go farther through the larval phase. Um, and so, you know, why is this? Why aren't we seeing um, relatively tight relationships that, that the way that they've been seen um, on the West Coast and the way they've been seen up in New England? And I think if we look at water quality as uh, a multiple stressor problem, um, we have this, this puzzle and these multiple different uh, kind of water quality pieces that have to fit together to really get good larval production. And where we are um, operating is in a relatively, well, a very large estuary with an extremely large um, watershed. So it spans three states. You can see the watershed goes way up into um, uh, New York even. And 45 or so percent of the water that comes into Chesapeake Bay actually comes down the Susquehanna River. So through the New York, uh, Pennsylvania, Maryland watershed into the top of the bay and then filters down. And then obviously we're also getting a, the rest of the water um, through other tribs and some out of the Atlantic um, through the opening at the bottom. Um, but just and, and just to kind of put that in comparison um, and to get a better understanding of why our system might be so dynamic, um, I've looked at the other two sites in relative terms um, and realized just how small a watersheds that these two systems are. And I, I'm not complaining that, that we're operating in a, in a tricky watershed, but it is a very large and very dynamic estuary. And so these are um, two panels, Chesapeake Bay on the left, um, Neat Tarts Bay on the right, the arrow's pointing to teeny little Neat Tarts Bay, if you can see that on your screen, um, same um, scale of the two maps. Um, same thing for Mook Sea Farms, the arrow's pointing, um, the resolution's not great, but at, at where the Dermascata River drains, um, and again, same scale relative to Chesapeake Bay. And so I think the sheer scale and the sheer size of the watershed means that we aren't able to see the same tight relationships between um, carbonate chemistry and larval performance, because I think we truly do have a very um, dynamic environment that and we're dealing with multiple stressors that are causing the larval um, problems that we uh, have. Um, we also have done some uh, buffering, and during those times, we didn't see any clear improvement in larvae culture. Now, now most of those instances were being done when we were having trouble with larvae production already, and so I think that just helps underline that you know it's it's not this single stressor of of carbonate chemistry that's causing our problems, but but something much larger. Um, and so there there is some effort through VIMS um, with funding from NOAA to get a better handle on this larger um, kind of multiple stressor picture. And so uh, a proposal um, led by Ryan Carnegie with a lot of really bright minds at VIMS and elsewhere are working on looking at things like um, uh, microbiome, have toxins, um, and what kind of uh, water quality management solutions we might be able to build around those. So including carbon chemistry, but also these other things that might be contributing to our problems in the Bay. And so in the meantime, what we've done at our site is, is basically try to figure out a workaround. And so our problems seem to be very seasonally um, positioned. And so we have really good production early in the season, January, February, 
during the spring bloom and the spring warm up that that kind of goes to pot. Um, May June we have another pretty decent window, um, and then July and August um, is pretty sketchy most of the time. And I should have better oriented this plot, but um, basically the green uh, being good production, the yellow being marginal, and the red being poor production. And so we've now tried to orient our season so that we do most of our seed production in January and February and most of our larvae production in May and June until we can get some type of solution figured out for these really difficult periods. Um, maybe that's water quality management, maybe it's it's something else. Um, and then just briefly to mention some future work that we have planned at our hatchery specifically. Um, uh, sea Grant and uh, And so we actually wanted to do this in 18 because of some uh, water quality issues I don't have time to get into related to climate change, not specifically to carbon and chemistry, but to climate change. Uh, we struggled with larvae production 18, and so we actually have this on the docket to um, work on this coming year in 19. Um, and we look forward to being able to do that. And uh, with that, I think I've taken up enough time, and um, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Mike, for the excellent overview of the challenges being faced in Virginia and how they compare to um, some of the challenges that Meredith is facing in Maine as well. I think it's really interesting to see that comparison. <clears throat> We'd like to give a minute um, to, to get Peter on board. And um, if anybody has any questions, please remember to type those into the question box, because um, we'll be following up with questions after Peter's discussion. Peter, are you all set? One second. Okay. I am ready. Hopefully you can all hear me. Okay. Thank you. So thank you for the introduction. As you could tell through my introduction, I am not a scientist. Um, my company, Atlantic Cape Fisheries, owns a number of businesses throughout the United States and uh, over in China. We, one of our businesses is Island Scallop, which is, I believe is up on the screen now. And Island Scallop uh, is a vertically integrated company located near Qualcomm Beach on Vancouver Island in British Columbia. And, you know, our experiences at Island Scallop are very different from the uh, two previous presentations. You know, obviously there's a lot of research ongoing in Canada and the world. But like I said, our business have been mixed. Um, we had very costly mortality events um, that we experienced in the past uh, and have been proven through research and blamed it on um, cost upwards of a million dollars and we had to find out what was happening and why. Uh, we were in a position to either find a solution or divest our investments in Island Scallop. Um, most of the hatchers on the West Coast have been seeing larval rearing problems and it's attributed to ocean acidification. As a result, most hatcheries are paper focused on just pH alone. Um, you know, we are guilty also of adding more and more chemicals to counteract what we deemed as bad water. When we hired a new manager a few years ago, basically he threw everything out the window and started from scratch. We stopped buffering our seawater um, and have seen 
better survival rates because we stopped buffering that water. Um, we're probably one of the only shellfish hatcheries not using, you know, a cocktail of chemicals to alter the water chemistry. And we're seeing consistently good results. Um, through observations in and around our various grow out areas. Have been still spawning and reaching maturity while our hatcheries were struggling. So through on the ground observations, we basically stopped buffering our water. Um, in a variety of recent in in recent years um, you know we used to get red tide out in British Columbia from like May to August each year but now we see year-round closures uh, for many different biotoxins and red tide events um, you know ocean of acidification we believe has really a larger role in changing the chemistry of the water um, causing more pathogens and less than favorable algae species that cause mortality and biotoxin issues uh, in and around the West Coast. Um, another thing is the, what our, one of our concerns is, is that the seed coming out of perfect water from the hatchery is getting stressed out and failing when it's put into the ocean uh, for for grow out, it just gets a chemical makeup of water, natural makeup of the water, and we've had problems with mortality events when we did that. Um, so. I mean, those are our boots on the ground observations that have been very costly for us to identify. And believe it or not, through the observations of our uh, employees out at Island Scallop um, and seeing the natural growth that's occurring with mussels and clams and oysters in and around the island, um, we basically kind of threw the playbook out the window and went more with mother nature and for the most part stopped our buffering efforts. Um, but that's not to say that ocean acidification isn't a real problem out there. Um, we spent a lot of money and lost a lot of money out there. You know, uh, we lost about a million bucks out there and we were close to, close to shutting down the whole operations. Um, until we just kind of took a step back and a deep breath and looked at what was, you know, Mother Nature was providing. Um, so my my West Coast experiences are different and may provide some hope for some people, um, but those are the only experiences that I can speak from. And uh, you know, obviously, you know, this is um, ongoing throughout the world and there are worldwide resources behind it um you know trying to utilize work with universities um you know we work with a university called or an institute called the hakai institute uh and they've all installed ocean acidification monitoring equipment all over the coast and they're part of the nan news monitoring network from uh, alaska to california so those are my experience, real world experiences, um, you know, from a vertically integrated company's perspective uh, that, you know, works with a lot of shellfish and <clears throat> different fisheries um, on basically a global uh, perspective. So, and that's, that's what I've pretty much got. Peter for joining us for your perspective and thank you Meredith, Mike and Peter for each of you sharing your perspectives on ocean acidification. It's really wonderful to hear about 
the researcher incorporating your hatchery and your farmer's operations, and to hear about the contrasting conditions and the responses across the country that you're seeing. Um, I think it's been really valuable for everyone today. I'd like to take a minute as we move into the discussion um, to introduce the university scientists who will be joining us today um, to help field questions on the discussion. The first is Daphne Monroe. She's an assistant professor at the department. Uh, let me show my screen real quick here. She's an um, assistant professor at the Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences at Rutgers and a shellfish ecologist at the Hashkins Shellfish Research Laboratory. Her research focuses on the ways that we can achieve sustainable management of coastal marine resources, such as shellfish fisheries and aquaculture. Joe Salisbury is a research associate professor at the Ocean Process Analysis Lab at UNH. His research interests focus on characterizing distributions of carbon dioxide, air-sea carbon exchange, productivity and asset stress, and freshwater influenced coastal regions, and using remote sensing data from a variety of space-borne sensors to characterize net community productivity and carbon exchanges in coastal waters. And the third scientist joining our discussion today is Jeremy Tessa. He's an associate professor and systems ecologist at UMCS Chesapeake uh, Biological Lab in Solomons, Maryland. He uses a combination of modeling and empirical approaches to understand coupled watershed estuarine biogeochemistry with a recent emphasis on the different external forces and internal processes that regulate acidification in estuaries. Joe, Jeremy, and Daphne, I'd like to ask you for a minute if you can reflect on the presentations you've just heard and how they might relate to your own current research focus. And then after those discussions, we'll move forward with questions from the audience. So Joe, would you like to lead off the discussion? Did you say Joe? Yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. Good. Thank you. Well, well, thanks a lot. Those are really three fascinating uh, uh, talks. I, I've had the uh, good opportunity to uh, work with uh, Bill Mook and Meredith White um, fairly closely um, until the last couple of years. And um, I have also had the opportunity to work uh, to a lesser extent in, um, in Mike's Hatchery and a couple others in, uh, in Chesapeake Bay. And you know, I want I want to say right right away, I, I really enjoyed uh, Peter's uh, talk uh, at the end. And there's this, you, you know, there's there there's this group of questions uh, that that you know we've we've all developed as to what exactly is happening. And and you know, I I don't I I know that there's research out there with Wallbusters Group at, at OSU and and uh, you know elsewhere around the world that that shows these, uh, you know, these chemical thermodynamic uh, uh, processes that are uh, really clearly related to, um, you know, early, early shell growth. But as we just heard here is, is you know, once a uh, organism tends to be established, you know, all, all bets are off. There's, there's so many more questions that we have about the, uh, you know, a, a, about uh, production in uh, in hatcheries and its direct relationship to what we measure in terms of, of carbonate chemistry. So that really that really came out. It was like uh, you know the three bears type of talk. You know, the, uh, Meredith had uh, has this really clear relationship for for early production, for larval production anyway, and and Mike, you know, a little little bit less so. And Peter said, you know, throw Throw, throw it out because it's not working for us uh, right now. And I, I remember like when we went from um, uh, Bill's hatchery where Meredith worked down to Mike's and, and, and another one in, um, in Virginia, you know, we saw these omegas, you know, down around, you know, 1.2 or even less than one in some areas. And they say, you know, we know what your problem is. Well, that lasted about um, you know, you know, a week before they said, no, you know, we're, we're getting, we're getting uh, decent production at these, that these low omegas. And so there's, there's something else going on besides acidification alone. And, and I know that, you know, Burke Hales, uh, uh, another researcher at, at, uh, out of Oregon State, likes to say that ocean acidification, you know, makes a bad day worse. And, and, it, and it, I, I'm pretty certain that it does. It doesn't, it doesn't help any one situation that has given a uh, that has given a talk today, but exactly how it works, um, uh, we are we're still confused. And and I like the the direction that Mike is and Meredith is going in. But Mike talked about this um, 
this new research where you know they're looking at this these these synergistic effects between harmful alga, you know, the microbiology, physical parameters, as well as the chemistry and, 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 and disease. And therein, I think, is going to, you know, answer a, a lot of questions. If I could take one more, uh, one more minute, I, I do want to harken back to a slide that I saw from Meredith that I hadn't, hadn't seen before that I think is really compelling. And Meredith, you showed the, uh, you showed these three pH curves with different treatments, and there was, uh, you know, ambient pH, and then a little bit lower, and then a little bit lower than that. And and I want you to recognize that the the uh, that, that that diurnal variability got much greater as you uh, decrease the pH. And so this is this is expected when we when we add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and it gets into the surface water, we change something called the Rebel factor. And so basically what this means that in estuaries where we're producing shellfish, we're going to see a bigger range of pH values, you know, below and above. And I think that's, uh, that in itself is uncharted territory uh, because we don't, um, you, you know, shellfish and shellfish larvae have really not experienced those ranges in, in, in thousands of, uh, years, so that's something to, to watch out for with your grandchildren and 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 beyond. Uh, we we think these estuaries will have a lot more diurnal type of variability. It'd be more like a you know carbonate chemistry storm instead of a instead of a gradual change. So again, thank you to all three, and I'll be interested in uh, some of the Daphne and Jeremy. Thank you, Joe. Daphne or Jeremy, do you have any thoughts you'd like to share? Um, yeah, so hi, this is um, this is Daphne. Um, first of all, um, thanks to the uh, to the presenters. This was really interesting to hear how varied all of the perspectives are. And um, I'll, I'll uh, start off as well by caveating this to say that I am not a carbonate chemist at all, um, but rather a biologist. And so my interest is more on the, the biological response side. And and just you know seeing among and this is something that um, hatchery managers are very aware of is that you know one year to another you can get very different things going on in your hatchery and it's all quite mysterious and you could try to um, do things the exact same way every time and something might change and um, one of the things that I think it's it's really an important thing. Um, the, these industries, this you know, shellfish aquaculture is something that we view as a, a very green and eco-friendly food production system. It's very uh, low impact. It you know, it, it fits very well in in natural ecosystems. It relies on clean water, and so you know, these industries uh, kind of are at the forefront of being um, the canaries in the coal mine, if you will. Um, they're paying very close attention to water quality. And because of that, and because the species they work with are so sensitive, um, they're able to kind of detect uh, shifts in our ecosystems before it becomes evident maybe with, with other um, observation systems. And so, you know, just the fact that there's very different things going on in, in all of these three places um, tells us that there's, you know, there's, there's really finely tuned things going on um, that um, we don't understand very well in terms of changing climate and changing water chemistry um, and how that links to biology um, and so I, I was I was glad to hear you know the very different um, uh, perspectives and um, I'll, I'll not say too much more because I think um, I want to make sure we leave time for people to ask questions um, and if if there aren't other questions we can maybe ask some questions of some of the uh, presenters as well so I'll uh I'll pass the microphone now. Yeah, I'll try to be quick just to follow on on a couple of the points. Uh, again, um, just to reiterate what was already said, I am really impressed by this, this work and all this thinking that's going in at the hatcheries to understand their system. And this is all um, as Joe said, uh, really compelling information. So I think the, you know, the one thing I'll add on so that we can have some discussion is that, you know, the, it's just this role of 
you know, freshwater inputs. And it, it can do a multitude of things to estuaries. Um, but, you know, in some ways, primarily what it does is in, in some of these more vulnerable marginal waters like exist in, in northern parts of Chesapeake Bay where people are growing, is that it can, you know, just bring the salinity far enough down in these extreme events where, you know, the, the, all the oysters are just not going to do very well. And so it's, it raises this challenge that we have with thinking about the future and how you know, increases in precipitation and freshwater flow, which we don't necessarily capture very well or understand how they're going to play out and how they interact with all the other features that will change, um, you know, looking 50 years down the road. It's it's definitely one of the things that challenges us looking ahead. That's it. Thank you, Jeremy. <clears throat> I think at this point we have about so 10 minutes left for audience questions. Um, Anthony, do you want to facilitate those? Yeah, thanks, Kirsten. <clears throat> so we do have a few questions that have come in here, and if anyone else um, has more as we go along, feel free to drop them in the questions box. Um, one of the, it's kind of a common theme through all the talks today. Um, we've, we see this regional um, variability across the three different um, locations that we heard about. Um, does anybody on the panel or any of the presenters know of any specific thresholds for acidification for any shellfish species, at which point we start to see impacts? And could that kind of be used um, along with monitoring efforts to know maybe which regions are more susceptible to OA versus other regions? I'm, I'm happy to speak to that a little bit, um, and if anybody else uh, wants to join in. Um, but I think even just the present the presentations today highlight that um, it's really hard to come up with thresholds. And I think, um, you know, what we're talking about between island scallops on the west coast um, and the east coast, we're talking about different species of shellfish, and there may be different sensitivities among different species, but there's also um, possibly different um, sensitivities among different strains, different strains of broodstock um, and things like that. And I th so I think, I think we, I, we, we don't see very clear, like there's not like a, you know, a line in the sand that um, has be become evident um, across everything. Um, so unfortunately, I, I don't know of thresholds, but I'm gonna mute now and let somebody else um, chime in. This is Mike from Oyster Seed Holdings. I'll just speak about that real briefly. So that that Bart, I think it was the Barton et al. 2012 paper, or one of the one of the papers that those guys put out around that same time that put a threshold for gigas at around 1.7. Um, basically, not to ever let your carbonate chemistry go below that. Um, what um, Joe kind of alluded to this earlier, but one of the things we've seen in our hatcheries that sometimes we're having fine production at like 1.0, 0.9. Um, and so I, I think there are some real differences across species, and I think it gets more complicated than that as well, in that the because these systems can be so dynamic, sometimes, you know, that may be the threshold, but based on other water quality changes, that threshold may change. Um, again, going back to this multiple stressor environment. Um, but, you know, the, the the short answer is just that you know I don't think we really know for Virginica yet what what that is, um, and we hope to to maybe get a little bit at that um, in this little frig up study we have, or at least kind of lay some groundwork so that other people um, smarter than us get into doing that work. And I would also like to comment on that question. This is Meredith White. Um, that for as uh, Daphne mentioned, the thresholds could be different for different uh, strains of the same species or different life stages of the same species. And as far as I know, um, no thresholds have been established for uh, juvenile or adult uh, oysters or other shellfish. Um, but then how you define that threshold could be very different if you are talking about it from like a biological perspective or an industry perspective. So you may have a threshold that the animal is able to live through, but it starts to produce thinner shells that are that make it a less desirable product when it gets to the market and chefs are trying to shock it and the shell breaks. And so from an industry 
an industry perspective, that threshold may be much more important to us or, or equally important, but that's an important threshold just as much as a mortality threshold is important. So this is Peter Hughes. I, I can't speak to what the threshold is. I can only speak to the fact that when you have multiple years of die-offs um, that, you know, very thin-shelled, uh, shellfish more focused on keeping itself alive than it is laying down shell, uh, it's a huge canary in a coal mine that something is going drastically wrong uh, and whether that was a man-made event in what may be our case, uh, or it's uh, a naturally occurring event. But when you start losing your uh, broodstock, you, you, know, you know something's going wrong. And I don't have any way to identify that. Thanks. Okay, thanks everyone for that. Um, we do have another question that I think we have time for, which may be a similar question that doesn't have a very clear answer to it, but we did touch on it in several of the presentations. Um, we know with all these different synergistic impacts in the environment that they are uh, impacting shellfish, but they'll also impact their food sources. So is anybody aware of any work being done or any initial reports of any kind of knowledge of how phytoplankton and zooplankton that these species um, feed on may be impacted by these coming changes? Yeah, this is Joe Salisbury. Um, yeah, so short is, answer is I don't know. It's not an area of my expertise, but I, I've seen a whole bunch of papers come across my desk in the, in the last couple of years where um, in laboratories, anyway, the uh, increased carbon dioxide it can make uh, toxins more more toxic. Um, we've also seen that you know algal growth could in actually increase under um, under a higher carbon dioxide scenario. So I, I think you know stay tuned for those papers because it's really clearly been identified in, as an area that needs study. But I, I don't think there's a tremendous body of literature out on it yet. But stay tuned. Hi, this is Daphne. Yeah, I'll add to that. You know, um, the as as Joe points out. Um, there's it's a little bit un, there's a lot of uncertainty around what um, what the algal responses might be and then just to pick up on the idea that Jeremy had mentioned um, earlier on these uh, events sometimes are associated with things like high rainfall events so you might not just be looking at a, at a, um, a change in the water chemistry but also a change in salinity um, and an associated change in temperature and so there's all of these kind of things there's all kinds of things that tend to happen at once um, and then and the other side in terms of like a climate change and a trajectory um, change and not a weather event um, you you're, you also need to think about um, the role of changing temperatures in the ocean, and so so it's um, very complicated. And and you know there are lab studies that can maybe give us some signposts and some um, some directions that things might go, but it's really hard to to say what would really happen in in the natural system. And I'll just add. Um, Again, without being able to say anything particularly conclusive, but you know, I think this role of food and toxins and um, associated problems, you know, it's a little bit of an unknown unknown, I think. And you know, in in a place like Chesapeake Bay, it's been documented that you know there's been changes in the relative abundance of certain um, you know phytoplankton species, and that you know there's been the emergence of certain HABs and kind of follow along one another and it's they, they come and go it's pretty dynamic behavior and so it is a challenge and something for us to try to learn more about and 
you can think about some of the tools that are out there now, like these, you know, flow cams that can quantify, identify the phytoplankton species that are passing through a place in near real time, you know, actually being a tool to answer these kind of questions in and around hatcheries. That's it. Okay, thanks everyone for your input on that. Um, I think we have time for one more question and then we'll wrap up. Um, we had a few questions come in around, um, kind of I guess our three speakers can speak to this probably the best, but we've all, we've been talking about all these different parameters um, that need to be monitored. Um, what kind of infrastructure exists or that maybe hatcheries would like to exist to be able to you know, monitor these conditions better, kind of what are your priority lists for monitoring certain conditions? Um, this is Mike with Oyster Seed Holdings. I'll, I'll jump into that just briefly. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that we were looking at in the SK grant that I mentioned is if it was possible to use some of the the newer, cheaper um, PCO2 SANs as um, instead of these um, more expensive uh, PCO2 gas monitors. So um, Joe Salisbury's lab and others have have similar things, but these use a really expensive, really accurate piece of equipment called a, a LICOR gas analyzer, I, I think, or something like that, that gives you a really um, good idea of what PCO2 is in the water with with some other uh, critical equipment that gets that gas to that um, monitor. But these are, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollar machines and they require uh, both physical maintenance and kind of remote maintenance. Um, by the lab that that creates them, and so they they get to be a very expensive piece of equipment and something that's nearly impossible for uh, a private commercial hatchery, at least in our case, to um, to operate um, or to operate continuously. And so we've relied on grant money and grant funding to ha get the little bits of of information that we've been able to with with equipment like that. And so I think. Um, you know, more studies that kind of look at comparisons of of maybe other kind of off the shelf type of stuff that might be quote unquote good enough for for use in a in a commercial hatchery just to give us an idea. And then also just um, a, you know better, I guess, idea of really what we should be looking for. What are the what are the critically important parameters that we really need to be watching for? And that's kind of what all this work that in Virginia anyway that we've been endeavoring to figure out and it's just been difficult to do. And so if um, I don't know if I end with anything, it would just be that, you know, we, we kind of, it, it's been frustrating for us in that we haven't found any really obvious parameters that are, are really important or we haven't even found, you know, the kind of these multiple things that when these two things are wrong, then we have production problems. But obviously there's this, um, you know, synergistic inter interactive uh, phenomenon that's happening to cause these larval failures and we just haven't quite gotten to it yet. So just not giving up on those type, types of efforts yet, I think is important to kind of keep going down that path to make sure that we get to a, a solution eventually. Yeah, this is Daphne. Uh, I'll, um, you know, support what Mike just said and a lot, the, a lot of the ways that we, um, uh, the tools that are currently available are very expensive and um, hatcheries operate on pretty low margins to begin with. Um, and one of the ways that um, on the science and monitoring side, we can try to support some of these uh, problems that Mike was highlighting um, is to, to have broader uh, monitoring, making data available, um, and trying to understand mechanistic links. Uh, so things like how does upwelling work with uh, rainfall and uh, maybe certain runoff uh, or, or you know um, uh, other kinds of input events? And so, um, if, if we can provide more, maybe more mechanistic understanding from the bigger um, kind of scientific monitoring network, some of those kinds of things might might start to help um, allow hatchery managers to identify places where 
um, there may be drivers that make sense to, to pay attention to. Yeah, folks, this is Joe. I was expecting maybe Meredith to say something on this, but um, you know, we monitored, uh, monitored PCO2 at, at Bill's lab for a, a, a few years and, and almost right away, uh, you know, they realized that their simple pH meters were giving them the information that they needed to take action on uh, whether to treat water or, or not. And so um, I, I would say, Mike, uh, you know, and, and others that, that, you know, you can use the the higher quality, more precise equipment to kind of parameterize your your your, your need, and uh, then there are you know pieces of equipment that are much cheaper that will work. All right, um, thanks everyone. We're running a bit short on time, so I think we'll have to leave the discussion there. Um, but feel free to email um, info at maycan.org for any questions we weren't able to get to today, and we can connect you um, with the speakers. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Kirsten Wakefield to wrap us up. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Peter, especially for putting together these great presentations today that really provided a lot of discussion points um, for everybody in the audience. And thank you, too, for Jeremy and Joe and Daphne for um, sharing your time with us today. Really appreciated the conversation. And just again, if you have further questions, please email us at info at midacan.org and we'll um, do our best to get those questions answered from the presenters. So thank you everyone and have a great day. Thank you.